Hey guys, it's Lizzie. So I've been researching into different forms of Christianity this year. And one thing I learned really fast is that both Catholic and Orthodox Christians also the Oriental Orthodox churches, so Coptic, Syriac, Nestorian, they believe that Mary was an ever virgin, not just when she became pregnant with Jesus, but even after that and for her entire life. In Catholicism, this is church dogma, which means that every Catholic has to believe it. Dogma is the highest level of objective, absolute truth. If you go to an Orthodox service, they will constantly be singing about the Theotokos, which in Greek means mother of God. And they sing about how the Theotokos in giving birth preserved her virginity. My initial reaction to learning this was, wow, why do you hate sex? There's nothing wrong with sex. My perspective until very recently was that this whole dogma seems made up and objectively wrong because the Bible clearly talks about Jesus brothers and sisters in multiple places, even naming them, the most prominent being his brother James, who was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. I thought this was crazy. I never looked into it being true because if Mary was married to Joseph and they had children, clearly they were having sex and she was not an ever virgin. But I investigated into this and shockingly, I actually became convinced that this was the belief of the early church and of the apostles and it's even proven in the Bible. And this video is five reasons why. Let me know in the comments, but I challenge everyone watching this, watch all the way through if you currently agree with how I used to think. I will be shocked if by the end, anyone disagrees with this. Once you look into the etymology and the culture and church history, it just seems obvious. And even Protestant founders like Martin Luther and John Calvin agreed with this doctrine. Because it's hard to let this heart believe when my mind is screaming out, I need more evidence. But do I really need more evidence? Real quick, so my shirt is from this website called beastforchrist.com. Do you guys get it? Beast, be a saint, because we're all saints for Christ. One of my subscribers actually runs this company. I think they're really cute shirts, but I've actually been wearing this out too, because I think it encourages everyone to live out their faith, but in a chill, non-confrontational way. It kind of shouts out Christianity, you know what I mean? And he wants to give all of you 20% off as a reward for watching my YouTube channel. I was just kidding, but you can get 20% off with my code Lizzie20. But this is legit my favorite shade of blue, but mostly the fabric is just really really soft It's like that amazing t-shirt soft fabric like I literally wear this to sleep in it's that soft And we're actually doing a giveaway together if you want to win a free shirt and you want to twin me Oh my gosh, that would be so cute the giveaway thing's gonna be on my Instagram and I'm gonna pick the winner So back to this video five reasons why Mary was a perpetual virgin number one Mary was given away when Jesus was dying on the cross. In John 19, 25 through 27, quote, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, and a lot of other people. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, which is referring to the apostle John, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The significance of this passage. In first century Jewish culture, it was patriarchal, which meant the men took care of the women. So the husband would take care of the wife financially. And then if the husband died, it would go to the oldest son and the next son and then the husband of the daughter. So Joseph 100% is dead at this point, not living, because this means that Jesus as the firstborn son was financially responsible of Mary. So if Jesus had any siblings, Mary would automatically default to the next oldest son. It would have been disgraceful, just unheard of, for Jesus to give his mother away to one of his friends if he had a living sibling. And so he just didn't have any siblings. This Bible passage proves it. 
Jesus is given Mary to the Apostle John, who later wrote this down in the gospel in which we're reading it in, because Jesus was an only child. There's just not another explanation of this passage. So then, it seems like we need another explanation of the passages referring to Jesus' brothers and sisters. Number two, the Greek word for siblings and cousins is the same word. Why is that so easy? <laughs> Adelphos is the Greek word. This is what it looks like. There's no way besides context to distinguish the difference between a brother or sister and a cousins. And it actually makes sense within Jewish culture that there is this ambiguity not knowing if it's a sibling or a cousin because of their living arrangements. Unlike how in Western culture today, we just live with our primary family unit, their extended family was extremely close to each other and they would all live in one big housing complex complex together. The main patriarch of the house, like the grandfather, would have their children. And then when the son would marry a wife, she would become part of the family. The daughters would be given away to different families. And then the sons and their wives would have children. And so then the grandchildren of the main patriarch, all of them would be living together. So based upon that context, it actually makes sense that sibling versus cousin is kind of ambiguous because everyone's living as if they are siblings. They grew up together and so they're all pretty close to each other. So any Bible verse where it says, Jesus brothers, Jesus brothers and sisters, just remember that Adelphos also means cousins. And we can actually make a family tree with some of the brothers and sisters that were actually cousins listed in the gospel accounts. Can we just take a moment? This is so cool that we even know this. Genealogy is so cool. So according to the first century Christian historian Hegesippus, Hegesippus, Joseph had a brother named Clopas who had a wife also named Mary. And we see this other Mary and her sons, Jesus' cousins, in scripture. In Matthew 27, when Jesus is on the cross, many women were there watching from a distance. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and other people. So clearly this is different than the Virgin Mary, Jesus' mom, or they would have said that. And the wording Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, it's almost like these people have already been mentioned. And they have. Matthew 13, 55. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Two of these people, James and Joseph, clearly the sons of this other Mary. To quote Jerome, a really important Christian in the early church, the only conclusion is that the Mary who is described as the mother of James was the wife of Alphaeus and the sister of Mary the Lord's mother, the one who is called by John Mary of Clopas. Mystery solved. What about James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. Christian tradition teaches that he is the half-brother of Jesus from a former marriage that Joseph had. To quote Eusebius, a church historian, James was called the brother of the Lord since he too was called Joseph's son and Joseph Christ's father. Number three, the word until, which in Greek is hios. Matthew 1.25 but he, Joseph, did not have sexual relations with Mary until Heos, her son, was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. So the word until in an English translation seems to imply that the action of sex definitely happened after the until. But if we go back to the Greek that this was originally written in, the term hios becomes more obscure. So the way that a lexicon works, or the way that you figure out the connotation definition of an ancient word, is that you look at every use of the word amongst Bible verses or ancient sources, and then collectively, based upon all the usages, connotations of the word, you can try to figure out what it means. So if we look at hios in the Greek New Testament and the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's really obvious that hios does not always mean a change after a certain point. In some places it does, but not always. Here are some examples of hios in the Bible. Matthew 28, 20. Jesus says, and surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. So hios here, obviously cannot mean Jesus will stop being with us after earth when we get to heaven. Until, in this case, means that it continues. Just like how Joseph continued to not have sex with Mary. Matthew 22, 43-44 The Lord said to my Lord, 
sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So Jesus is quoting the Septuagint here. And obviously, Jesus is not going to stop sitting at the right hand of God after he defeats Satan until, in this context, again, does not mean a change after that point. There are so many other examples of Heos in the Greek New Testament and the Septuagint. If you want to see even more, there's an article by an Orthodox theologian with way more examples, but I think I've proven my point. Number four, virginity and celibate marriages were a thing in the ancient world. So Mary and Joseph having a marriage where they never had sex wasn't all that odd for the ancient world. In fact, in Jewish culture, it was sort of obvious based upon their situation of her carrying in her womb God in the flesh. The Jewish philosopher and historian Philo of Alexandria, who lived from around 20 BC to 50 AD recorded a common Jewish interpretation of scripture at that time where Moses did not have sex with his wife Zipporah after experiencing God seeing the burning bush. Another common Jewish theology of the first century was an interpretation of number seven, which is kind of a strange passage. But basically Moses consecrates the temple and then certain leaders of each Israelite tribe are chosen to present gifts in front of the consecrated altar. And because the altar was anointed and God's presence was there in this specific way, they were not allowed to go back and ever have sex with their wives again because they'd experienced God in this encompassing, intense way. Regardless of whether or not these later interpretations reflect what actually happened at the time, the point is this was the common Jewish understanding around the time that Jesus was born. I don't think it's this idea that sex is bad, but that some things like encountering God, experiencing God in these extreme ways is so much better in this whole different realm than sex. And it makes sex seem not right after all of what you've experienced. I mean, we're not going to have sex in heaven because we're going to fully see, fully experience God and we're not going to miss it. From our perspective of Western culture post-sexual revolution, it's kind of like, why couldn't they have sex? They should. It's their right. Literally what I used to think. But in the ancient world, it would have been like, of course they don't have sex after Mary literally gives birth to God in the flesh. And this whole thinking of a celibate marriage wasn't just a part of Jewish culture. The Romans had Vestal virgins, priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, who were not allowed to have sex until they were 30 years old. The Babylonians had a type of celibate marriage of sorts where they could get married, but they weren't allowed to have children. But most important for us, there were spiritual marriages in early Christianity, where two people would be economically legally married, but they would never have sex. And like for everything I'm saying in this video, source below, go read for yourself. It's so interesting. The valuing of virginity and having a spiritual marriage in part became so popular in the first and second century because of the example of Mary and Joseph's marriage. And a spiritual marriage was seen as a positive thing. I mean, even Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, when he recommends couples to take breaks from having sex to focus on prayer. Read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 7. Paul raves about not having sex not getting distracted from God. And Jesus echoes a similar point in Matthew 19, 10 through 12, how it is better to be abstinent. Jesus remained abstinent. It's not about sex being bad, but finding something so much above the realm of physical pleasure. And in giving birth to and raising her child, Jesus, our savior, who is fully God, Mary was not missing out on anything. As Elizabeth says, you are blessed among women. And in Luke 1 48, Mary says, all future generations will call me blessed. Number five, in the early church, you couldn't be a Christian if you didn't believe this. The perpetual virginity of Mary was part of the original deposit of faith. It makes the concept of the incarnation of God extremely powerful. This idea that God is so holy, so above us, that after Mary gives birth to Jesus, it's just not right for them to have sex. It's like how in the Old Testament, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and if you touched it, you died. 
that kind of concept of the otherness set apart extremely to be worshipped forever nature of who God is. So here is evidence that everyone in the early church who wasn't a heretic, shout out to Tertullian, believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. Origen, who was born in the year 180, quote, there is no child of Mary except Jesus, according to the opinion of those who think correctly. This was in his commentary on John. So this was written in mid third century. Let's go earlier. Justin Martyr, born in 100 AD, just 10 years after the last apostle John died. And he wrote this in the year 160, making a comparison between Eve and the fall and this contrast with Mary, which was how people in the early church talked about Mary as the new Eve. For Eve, who was a virgin and undefiled, having conceived the word of the serpent, brought forth disobedience and death. But the virgin Mary received faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced the good tidings to her that the spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the highest would overshadow her. And by her has he been born and by whom God destroys both the serpent and those angels and men who are like him. Irenaeus, writing in his Against Heresies, wrote in the year 180, but he was born in 130, just 40 years after the death of the last apostle. In accordance with this design, Mary, the virgin, is found obedient. But Eve was disobedient, for she did not obey when as yet she was a virgin, was made the cause of death, both to herself and to the entire human race. So also did Mary, having a man betrothed to her, and being nevertheless a virgin, by yielding obedience, become the cause of salvation both to herself and the whole human race. For what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, this did the Virgin Mary set free through faith. So I want to emphasize that even though Justin Martyr and Irenaeus did not spell out explicitly Mary ever virgin, Mary perpetual virgin, I think the usage of referring to her solely as the Virgin Mary implies that. And I know what you're thinking, Eve is also referred to as a virgin, even though she ended up not being ever virgin. But keep watching for 30 more seconds and I will directly address that with this next point. So really early in the year 120, which is just 30 years after the last apostle died, so super close to the original apostles who knew Jesus, there's this fake gospel floating around, which obviously it's a fake gospel, but the psychology and culture behind this gospel proves a lot. So it's fascinating. It's called the Proto-Evangelium of James. I read all of it, it's really short, but it takes <laughs> explicit creative liberty. It's so awkward. Just go read the end. Explaining how Jesus was birthed and proving physically that Mary is still a virgin. Obviously a huge point of the Proto-Evangelium of James is this belief they're trying to prove through the fake gospel that Mary is a perpetual virgin. You might think, Oh, this popular fake gospel book. It's part of what made up the perpetual virgin myth about Mary. But I instead think of it as Christians at the time confronting this hard teaching that they're trying to explain or express through this vivid version of Jesus' birth story. If this was made up, in the second century. And again, what I want to emphasize, this Proto-Evangelium of James is year 120. The Apostle John died in the year 90, so that's so close to the early, early, early church. And already this idea is floating around the perpetual virginity of Mary. If this was just made up in the early second century, the second or third generation of Christian apologists would have a hundred percent refuted it. Irenaeus a hundred percent would have addressed it in his Against Heresies series or some other Christian leader. There were dozens of different heresies in the early church and all of them are thoroughly debated, refuted in these intense essays and books. The fact that this proto-evangelian thing exists means that we know that for the second generation of Christians in the early second century, this idea exists existed. And yet, it was not pronounced as a heresy. Instead, it seems to be implied when people like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, refer to her as Virgin Mary. Anyone who can believe 
that something different than what the apostles taught could have arisen in the first, second century undetected has not read enough of the early church fathers. These second, third generation of Christians were so intense, angry, detail-oriented, a bajillion scripture references backing everything up. They cared so much about the deposit of faith preserving the original truth of what the apostles taught. They took it so seriously, way more so than we do today. There is no way that any dogma we're seeing later in the third fourth centuries that survived is not part of the mainline church that was there from the beginning. So let's go back to early church writing quotes. Another leader in the church, Athanasius, in the year 360, says in his discourse against the Arians, quote, let those therefore who deny that the Son is by nature from the Father and proper to his essence, deny also that he took true human flesh from the ever virgin Mary. It's just obvious at the time that Mary is ever virgin. In the year 374, Epiphanius says, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who for us men and for our salvation came down and took flesh, that is, was born perfectly of the holy ever virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. 374, that's the teaching of the church. Didymus the blind in 386, for neither did Mary, who is to be honored and praised above all others, marry anyone else, nor did she ever become the mother of anyone else. But even after childbirth, she remained always and forever an immaculate virgin. That is in his essay called The Trinity. A fun story to end this video. So in the 4th century, this guy named Helvidius wrote a pamphlet arguing that Mary is not a perpetual virgin based upon Bible verses about Jesus' siblings. So then, this super important Christian theologian named Jerome, who you probably heard of, the Jerome Bible, he wrote a reply in 383. It's a pretty short essay actually, you guys should go read it, it's basically like what I discussed in this video, but it's hilarious and way more detail oriented, so much more wisdom obviously, it's Jerome. He refers to Helvidius as a quote, ignorant boar who has scarce known the first glimmer of learning. And here's another quote from Jerome that I hope encourages you to go read all of his essay. To defend his position, Helvidius piles up text upon text, waves his sword like a blindfolded gladiator, rattles his noisy tongue, and ends with wounding no one but himself. Who needs Netflix when you can just read the early church fathers going off about heresies? It's so amazing how intense it gets. I love you guys so much. Comment below if this video changed your mind. I made a blog post version of this video that's more in depth that's going to be linked below and also everything I mentioned in the description. I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!